One of the things that happened Wednesday that was pretty amazing, guys, is Wednesday we had, uh, we actually had somebody that was, uh, came to the service, and they came to the service, and their, their, literally their hand would not work. So their hand couldn't work at all. And they came and they were holding it up, and they couldn't put it down. Uh, it was swollen really bad. And if you touched it, matter of fact, someone came up and kind of bumped him, and he was like, ah, and, he was, and this is a friend of mine, uh, Jeff Diaz, and his, his hand was, he said, I said, brother, what's wrong? He said, I come to, to get a healing, and uh, I need a healing. I said, well, I'm a healer. I said, well, let's, come on. So we went back in the office, and we took anointing oil, and we anointed him and prayed over him, and it was one of those immediate miracles where all of a sudden his hand started moving, and he started getting uh, functioning to his hand. And I said, when we're in worship, I said, you just keep believing. And we went and worship. And by the end of worship, his hand was completely uh, mobile and working and being able to bend. And by the time he woke up the next morning, it was completely gone. And it was swole and fever and all that. And it was completely done. And that was a miracle of God. I mean, literally a miracle of God. Can we give the Lord a hand clap? Amen. And so that's one of those immediate miracles. He, was, he told me, I, he actually brought me to lunch the next day. He said, it's a miracle. It's a miracle. I said, I know it. I said, praise God. It is awesome. And so sometimes you get those miracles that uh, are immediate and they come like that. Uh, other times it may take a little bit. Who in here, I'm just asking, who in here, you, are, you, you really need God to move uh, in your circumstance, your situation, or you need a miracle from God, raise your hand. If you need a miracle from God, raise your hand up. Come on, raise your hand up. You need a miracle from God. You need God to move on something. Raise your hand up. I'll tell you what, God's going to do it for you. We've been talking about, you've been seeing how God's been moving just all year so far. God's going to do it for you. I have an encouragement for you. Don't give up on your miracle. You, you can't give up on your miracle. That's the title of today's message. Don't give up on your miracle. Because sometimes miracles come quick and they're immediate. But other times they take time. And you need to uh, understand that. That sometimes, you know, miracles take time. But remember, it's not, it's not our timing, but it's God's timing that determines that. Uh, but we had a man who was actually in the last, the first service. Uh, well, the 830 service because we have Thursday night, 8.30, and then 10.15. But he was in the uh, middle service, the 8.30 service. Keith he was actually here this morning. But when our church was in the building over there where the school office is at, that was our church at one point when we first started. When the church was there, uh, I remember him first coming into church, and he came to me, he said, Pastor, he said, uh, I've got a disease, and this disease is a bone-deteriorating disease. And he had uh, braces that he was having to wear on his feet. He was having a hard time walking. He was scared to do anything or jump because if he would, it would break his feet because they were getting brittle. So he had this disease. And, and I, I told him something. I said, listen, every time you come to church, I want you to find me and I'm going to pray over you. Every time. And we're going to pray and believe until God moves. And so he'd come and I'd pray over him. And you know, he'd come again. I'd pray over him. I know sometimes he'd come and I would be like, hey, let's pray. And he'd be like, okay. You know, because it, you know, it's over and over and over again. And you're just praying. You're praying. I said, I'm telling you, just keep coming and keep, let's just keep praying. And a long time passed by. And then finally, one day, I was happened to be out in the parking lot. And here comes a truck just right little truck just wheeling into the parking lot and really fast and I'm like whoa I said you know who's that and he jumped out and it was Keith and he jumped out and he had tennis shoes on and he ran up to me and he had x-rays because I saw the x-rays from the before where the bones were deteriorating and he had x-rays from the doctor he said look look he said my bones grew back by the way they don't do that unless you're a lizard amen and he ain't a lizard and so his bones grew back and literally he was healed and that was years ago and that disease has not come back he's completely healed by the power of the lord jesus christ come on give the lord a hand clap for that but I, i'm here to tell you if he wouldn't have been persistent and keep coming back coming back coming back 
he wouldn't have got his miracle. Because in, in certain things, the Lord just says, hey, I want you to be persistent on this. So don't give up on your miracle. I want to show you some examples in Scripture where people had to wait for the Lord to move, that it wasn't immediate. One is uh, Abram and Sarai. So Abram and Sarai, which later became Abraham and Sarah, God had promised them that he was going to give them a kid. But, you know, time passed, a lot of time passed, and it was no kid. And then so much time passed where it was impossible in the natural for her to have a child because she had passed the childbearing years. And so Abram and Sarai at this point, they decided that, you know, they need to help God out. And so they created an Ishmael. So I was like, hey, we need to help God. Obviously, you know, maybe we're supposed to make it happen. And so she brought a lady in, had him sleep with the lady, and said, when they have the baby, it'll be our baby. I mean, it didn't work out too good. I still don't work out good. So they created an Ishmael that became a thorn in their side and even a thorn in our side. Because they tried to help God out in the miracle by trying to make it happen. Now, we do play a part, but it's not that. And so we got to be careful when we're in the waiting time that we don't try to make something happen that's not God's timing to happen. Because we can create something that becomes a big headache in our lives if we do that. So we need to wait on the Lord. And it's not going to rush God. You can't push God into it. You can't rush him into it. He's going to do it his timing. We do play a part, but that's not the part to try to make it happen. Another example is the man at the pool of Bethesda. So the man at the pool of Bethesda, how long was he there? 38 years. Now, you got to understand something about this man. This man could barely get around. I mean, didn't he tell Jesus that, hey, when the pool stirred, I don't have anyone to help me to get to the pool. So he, he would have a struggle just moving. And he didn't live at the pool of Bethesda. So at the end of the day, guess what he had to do? He had to struggle to get back to wherever he was living, whatever bridge he was under, whatever uh, shelter that he would find. He had to get over there. So you know what he had to do the next morning? He had to crawl himself to that pool. Uh, He couldn't stand. So he had to crawl himself to that pool. And he said he didn't have anyone to help him, so maybe he had people early on. But after 38 years, that's a long time. But he still got himself up and got there. And what would have happened if he would have got tired of waiting? Because it's a hard, because it's a struggle. I mean, I can imagine some mornings it's cold and He's got to get out and start putting his hands and his elbows on that cold uh, stone that I've walked those streets, those cold stones trying to get to the pool of Bethesda and try to struggle his way there. What if he would have got discouraged and said, well, I'm not going today. But if he would have stopped going, if he wouldn't have went on that day, guess who he wouldn't have met? Jesus. There are sometimes we can get discouraged and sometimes where things get hard and difficult where our emotions are gone. As a matter of fact, your emotions are on the other side of the spectrum where they're telling you not to even worry about it, that it's too late, it's no use. you got to shut them up, and you got to say, no, I'm still going to press in. I'm still going to get to that place where there's a stirring so God can move. Some people, they're like, man, I don't feel like going to church. Let me tell you something. I've, I've been in here where the message, God gave me a message, and I know people's circumstances and situations, and I'll be like, wow, God's going to speak to them. This is exactly what they need in their life, and that day they don't show up. Because guess who else knows that's exactly what they need in their life? The devil. And he's out to stop you from getting what God wants to give you. And so I remember, Cindy, the times that we did not feel like, you know, when we were in the job and working and all the kids and Just, you know, we'd have some days where we'd be, and we're going to church like four days a week, and just, you know, we had some times where we're like, man, I'm a little tired, 
But we would go, you know what? We're going anyway. Yeah. And it was those times when I, we didn't feel like it because our emotions were a little worn out that we went anyway was the very times that God moved the most in our life. So the next time you feel like a little discouraged or you feel like, you know, oh, I'm a little tired or whatever, don't allow the enemy to stop you from getting to this place where God can bless you or in the prayer closet or in the scriptures or wherever it is where God's going to touch you. Can I get a good amen? And so we have to understand that. He didn't, he didn't give up. It was 38 years, and he kept on until God came himself and touched him. What about the man who was born blind? Sometimes we are born with some things. We're born in some things. And we have disadvantages, and we have struggles. And sometimes we're born with some things. And in this case, they were like, hey, who sinned, the parents or the man? And the Lord Jesus looked at him and said, the parents nor the man sinned. But he was born blind so that the glory of God might be revealed. Yeah. See, sometimes when you've got something you think you're stuck with, you've got to get to the place where you're willing to let that go and embrace the healing that God wants to give to you. Remember in the pool of Bethesda? He asked him, he says, what can I do for you? Because there's sometimes we start identifying ourselves with whatever that is that is not good in our life. And we've got to realize that when God, it comes time to get rid of that, we need to let it go. Yeah. So that God gets the glory. So that people will look at your life and they'll look at your circumstance and they see where you are today after God touches you and they go, wow, look what the Lord has done. Yeah. Or what about Israel for 425 years they were in bondage. And we know that through the 425 years that Israel was crying out for God to deliver them. I want you to think about this. Multiple generations were crying out that never saw the deliverance. But was it right for them to cry out day in and day out? Yes. Because if they would not have cried out, they wouldn't have got the deliverance here. It's almost like a, a, a master builder back in the day during the Bible times. When they would start a project, the master builder would understand that he's starting a project that he'll never see finished. But he would do it anyway because he had a, he had a, a picture in his mind that it's the next generations that are going to benefit from it. So he would build and do it right and give his all to it even though he would never see it. There are some things that we pray for in our lives, that we believe for in our lives, that we may never see while we're alive, but it doesn't mean it's not going to happen. I mean, what about the prophets? The prophets prophesied things that they never saw happen during their lifetime. But it was still the word of the Lord, and they still prophesied it. And guess what? Those things ended up happening, and there are some things that are prophesied in the Bible are still yet to happen. And they have been gone for hundreds of years, some thousands of years even. Yet it's going to happen. So there are times when we need to realize that we're praying, we're believing, we're building, but we might not see it. Will we still pray? Will we still believe? Will we still build? If we have God's kingdom in mind, we will. If we have God's heart in mind, we will. I remember uh, the property that we own here, the couple that owned it uh, back in the day, the wife actually had a desire that this place would be used for God. And the husband had no desire that that be done. And so he did not want to let it go. He didn't want to use it for anything like that. So she just was persistent and kept praying and asking God and kept talking to him. And finally one day at, he let her have a, a tent revival. He said, well, you can do a tent revival and that's it. And so well, that was it. And so after they passed on, guess what happens? A church buys the three acres of land. And then we came in, took over, and, and kept going. And we ended up buying all the land. And so what she believed for she never saw, but I believe if she wouldn't have believed for it or prayed for it, we wouldn't even be here today. See, can we do that? Can we realize that the miracle 
may come, but it may come after we're gone. Like, I know we're going to change the world. We're world changers. I know we significantly are now making an impact in the world, but I believe it's going to be in a greater fashion even while I'm alive, but I don't feel that that's even the end of it. I feel even after the days that we're gone, that guess what? The next generation is going to rise up and take what has been laid as a foundation in Christ Jesus, and they're going to continue to reach the world, and the whole world is going to be reached by the power of God through this ministry right here that God has planted. Come on, someone. But we have to believe. We have to believe and cry out and understand this. What about Joseph's dreams? Joseph, man, he was, he got the coat of many colors. He had favor from his parents. He was literally over his brothers. I mean, he was walking around. I'm blessed. I'm favored of the Lord. I'm too blessed to be stressed. I'm the head and not the tail. I'm sure Joseph was a little cocky back then. But what happened? So he thinks, oh, I see how this is going to work. But he didn't. Before he knew it, he was in a pit. And then he was in a pit. And then he was sold into slavery. Then he was betrayed when he was there. Then he ended up in jail. Then he was forgotten in the jail. And years went by. 22 years ends up going by before he ever saw the dream that God had given him fulfilled right before his eyes. See, there are some things that you may feel, I mean, God showed me this. God told me this. Don't give up on them. What if Joseph would have said, well, it ain't happening like I thought it was going to happen. By the way, it never happens like you think it's going to happen. I quit long ago trying to preconceive what it's going to be because it's always shattered by God. And it never happens like you think it's going to happen. But what if Joseph would have said, man, I'm done with you, God. I'm, I don't see what you told me, and so you must not be real. You, you, you must not be faithful. And he would have turned. He would have, never, he would have never ended up being in a position that he was in to save his family, not just his family, but the whole world. Because God is faithful. And God is not like us. He doesn't lie. He will do what he says he's going to do. Even when we're not faithful, he is. What about David's kingship? David's kingship, he was, man, uh, anointed by Samuel and in front of his brothers. Then he ends up, you know, working for Saul and playing the instrument and helping him out in his struggle. And then he kills the giant. Then he's an armor bearer. Then he takes over the parts of the military Jonathan is his good friend. Jonathan literally goes, man, I see God's anointing on you. I'm with you. So David in his mind is going, okay, I see how this is going to work. I'm going to serve Saul and for all these years, and when he dies, then I'll take over and be the king, and Jonathan will be right there helping me. I see how this is going to work until Saul got crazy. And then David's having to run, and David's in caves, and David is... You know, at one point, he was in another country, and he had to act like a crazy man just so he can survive. And so what I'm telling you this is that God's promise is real, but you may have to go through a few things to get there. And you can't give up while you're going through those things. You can't get bitter. You can't get mad at God. you got to realize that, hey, God is sovereign. Why do I got to go through this? I don't know. Why did Joseph go through what he went through for 22 years? Why did he do that? Well, the Bible tells us why. Because the Lord was testing him. See, when you're in your struggle, when you're in your darkest time, you got to realize that you're being tested by God. You know, anyone can serve him. The devil even said that about Job. Anyone can serve him when everything's going great. But what happens when it ain't going great in your life? Will you still be faithful to the Lord? Will you still wait for the promises of God to be revealed in your life? We must wait. We must realize when we're going through the struggle, the Bible even says rejoice and be glad because God's doing something in your heart. He's bringing you to a place of maturity in your faith so that you'll be complete, lacking nothing. 
You see, this is what the Lord wants us to realize. But there's a grace in the waiting. I have, I have encouragement for you. All you that raise your hand that need a miracle. I believe there are more that didn't raise their hand and need a miracle. Because you've already started giving up on it. I, I sense that in the Holy Spirit. I, I really sense that. When I asked who needed a miracle, there were quite a few people I sensed in the Spirit did not raise their hand. That's an indication you're already giving up on what God promised you or what you're believing for. You, you need to be shake. I'm shaking you right now. Not to harm you, but to wake you up to not give up. To embrace. To embrace the belief and understanding that God can do it. And I'm giving you encouragement that there's a grace for your waiting. We, it's found in Isaiah 40, verse 25 through 31. It says, to whom then will you compare me? That I would be his equal, saith the Holy One. Raise your eyes on high and see who has created these stars. The one who brings out their multitude by number. He calls them by name because of the greatness of his might and the strength of his power. Not one of them is missing. So for some of you that are discouraged, some of you that almost are giving up on what God has said he would do in your life or who he said he would touch in your life or, you know, getting you to the place that he told you you were going to be, let me, let me just say this. You just need to go outside and look up. Tonight, go outside and look up and see the stars in the heavens and realize the God that we are praying to is the same God who hung the stars. He's the same God that put them into place, and he knows them all by name. If he knows the stars by name, he knows you by name. And he knows everything that you deal with and what you're going through and what you need and when you need it. But he goes this, he says, why do you say, Jacob, and you assert, Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and the justice due me escapes the notice of my God? What they're saying is, man, does God really see my struggle? Does he really see my waiting period? Does he really see my suffering? Does he really see it? I don't think he sees it. And God says, do you not know? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary are tired. It's not like he's up there and he's like, oh, I'm, I'm tired. I, I, I really, I kind of missed that. I, I fell asleep. I fogged out. I think some of us think God somehow fogged out on us. He doesn't fog out on you. It says his understanding is unsearchable. He gives strength to the weary and to the one who lacks might, he increases power. So if you come in here and you're struggling, and you lack the strength, let me tell you something. God's the one that can give it to you. It says, though youths grow weary and tired and vigorous young men stumble badly, you can look, someone can be in the best shape of their life. They're still going to wear out. But he said, watch this. Yet, those who wait, say wait. wait. Those who wait for the Lord, watch this, will gain new strength. Some of you come in here and you, you're relying on your old strength. God says, no, I got new strength for you. I got a new word for you. I got a new hope for you. You're going to have new strength. They will mount up on the wings of the eagle. They will run and not get tired. And they will walk and not become weary. Some of you are like, I don't know if I can get there. That's okay. God will carry you there. Come on, someone. Is anyone hearing what I'm saying in this place? God will carry you there. However, so what do we do while we wait? There is something we're called to do while we wait. What do we do? First of all, we're to keep faith and hope. Don't let it go. Keep faith and hope. We are to look for God's grace and strength where we're at right now. And we are to continue to petition heaven until we see it done. Now, this is the part I feel that many times we give up on. We pray about something, and when we don't see it, we stop praying about it. We stop journaling about it. We put it on a shelf somewhere. It gets dusty. It gets old. It gets tattered. Let me tell you something. 
You need to keep it before God. That's the role we play is to continue in crying out to God for God to do it in our life. Just like I told Keith, I said, you got to keep coming back. And you got to keep praying over you and praying over you and praying over you and praying over you and praying over you until we see God do it. Not every miracle is immediate. Some we have to wait on. And when we're waiting, we got to keep petitioning. You know, when the Lord gave instruction on how we to pray, everywhere he gave instructions on how we are to pray, he gave the same exact thing. He said, you have to be persistent. He knows the Father, and he knows what moves the Father. He says, you've got to be persistent. You've got to ask, you've got to knock, and you've got to seek, and you've got to not give up until he gives it to you. In Luke 18, 1 through 8, we see him explain this. It says, now he was telling them a parable to show that at all times they ought to pray and not become discouraged. I believe some people come in here, you have become discouraged. And the Lord says, you don't have to stay discouraged. But he said, this is what you need to do. In a certain city, there was a judge who did not fear God. He did not respect any person either. Now, there was a widow in that city, and she kept coming to him saying, give me justice against my opponent. So someone was doing her wrong. And remember that scripture, his justice escapes my notice. God doesn't see what's going on. He, she says, give me justice for my opponent. For a while, he was unwilling But later he said to himself, even though I do not fear God nor respect any person, yet because this widow is bothering me, bothering me, I'm going to elbow your neighbor, elbow him again, elbow him again. Eventually you're going to get their attention, right? Right? I will give her justice, otherwise by continually coming, she wear me out. And the Lord said, listen to what the unrighteous judge said. Now will God not bring about justice for his elect who cry out to him day and night? And will he delay long for them? I tell you that he will bring about justice for them quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? So what he's saying is, when Jesus comes back, will people still be crying out? Will people still be crawling up to the altar, banging on the door? Will people still be asking God to move in their life? Or have they given up on the divine miracles of God? Have they, have they come to the conclusion, I'm just going to fi- follow the natural commandments, and I'm not going to depend on the supernatural God? By the way, I just described most of Christianity. I believe in the supernatural power of God to move. You have been hearing it, hearing it, hearing it. We have read it, read it, read it throughout our lives in the scriptures. We, have we become like Gideon that said, oh, I read about all these miracles, but where are they at? And he didn't even recognize he was in the mir- middle of a miracle because the angel was speaking to him. Don't give up on your miracle. Keep believing. Keep crying out. Keep knocking. Keep seeking. Keep scratching. Wear God out. Wear Him out. Bother Him. I hear people all the time, I don't want to bother God about this. Why not? Jesus said bother Him. We need to bother Him about everything. Because He cares about the little things as much as He cares about the big things. As a matter of fact, in my life, I am more encouraged, it's crazy, I guess, but I am more encouraged when God does something very, in your eyes, would be like super small. It wouldn't probably amount to a hill of beans to you. But when it's done for me, and even though it's small, I actually get more excited about those than I do the huge things I've seen God do. You know why? Because I see how much He cares. That is not just the big, we think God's for the big things in our life. God's for everything in your life. Come on, someone. He's for everything in your life. 
I remember uh, Cindy, you come up. I remember uh, Cindy Levi when he was born. He had a, different issues going on, sicknesses and everything. And uh, as he kind of got through those things, uh, when he was about 18 months old, one of the things we had noticed as he was growing is one of his legs were not keeping up with the other leg. And literally, uh, we noticed it, honestly, by putting an outfit on him and realizing uh, the outfit, we had to roll up one of the pants legs because it was too long. One of the pants legs was too long. We thought it was a defective outfit until we realized, oh my goodness, that leg's not keeping up with the other leg. It's not a defective outfit. He's, his leg's an inch and a half shorter than the other leg. An inch and a half. I'm not talking about a quarter, an inch and a half. So, as a father, as a mother, so what we do, we just start praying. I remember going in there every night, and I'd lay hands on him. He'd be in his bed, and I'd just put my hand on him. I'd say, Lord, Father, I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that you'd make his leg grow in Jesus' name. And nothing would happen. The next night I'd go in and I'd say, Father, I believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that you can do this. Make his leg grow in the name of Jesus. Make his leg grow. Nothing happened. Go in there another night. Father, I believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that you can make his leg grow. Father, make his leg grow in the name of Jesus Christ. Nothing. Go in there again. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you can make it. And this went on and on and on for months and finally one night I was in there I had my hand on him same way I always did and by the way one of the things about praying through and believing God is you got to forget about your feelings because it's not about feelings it's about faith feelings will abandon you very quickly but your faith never will unless you abandon it. And so you got to just have, so I was in there that night. I didn't see angels in the room. I didn't feel chill bumps. Nobody was behind me with a keyboard playing. It was just me praying. And I prayed just like I prayed every other. I didn't do anything different. But this night, something happened different. I sensed something took place when I prayed. I didn't have chill bumps. I didn't have none of that. I just sensed in here, I didn't even, I kind of saw the sheet, something with sheet, but I was thinking, to be honest with you, I thought, oh, he just moved his leg because he's sleeping. And, but I don't know, just something in here said, no, something just happened. So I took the covers off and I pulled his legs out and I was like, oh my God. I said, Cindy, Cindy. So I started calling out for Cindy to come in, didn't I? And what did I do when you came in? How did I have him? Show him me that his legs were even. Look, look. I said, get, a, get an outfit. So she got an outfit, put the outfit on him, and the outfit fit. Because God moved. Can I get an amen? Because God moved. Sometimes you just got to keep going. You just got to not give up. You got to keep believing. I, I mean, Montgomery, our campus in Montgomery. We have a Lifehouse University in Montgomery. We have a, a building we just bought, Jeffrey, uh, in November, right? It's November. But a few years back, we actually, you know, Pastor Matt Bostic, uh, we connected with him, started working with him. We knew we needed a building to house men, to help these men. And so Pastor Matt had found a place, and we went and looked, Jeffrey, we looked, went and looked at it, and we said, all right, is this the place? And we're going to believe God for this place. Well, they wanted $1.2 million somewhere up in there for this building. And, of course, we didn't have that. And so they wanted this money for the building, and so we was like, okay, we're going to believe God. He's going to give us this. So we started, you know, just believing and, and doing our part. We even said, we're going to do a vision night in the building. So we did a vision night in the building. We had a couple hundred people there from dignitaries to judges to uh, elected officials, pastors, just different ones that came to this vision night. 
And we showed them, yeah, this building's going to be our building. It wasn't our building. It belonged to someone else. We asked them permission to do the event there, and they gave us permission. We said, it's going to be our building. We're going to do Lifehouse University here. We're going to have men living in here. And we're showing them pictures of things that we're going to, it was going to look like. Well, guess what happened? After that vision meeting and after that year passed, guess what happened? No, nothing. We didn't get it. So we looked at each other, and Jeffrey was like, well, he said, I think we'll rent the office and just stay in the building. I like, let's do it. So we, we rented the office and just staying in the building. And we said, let's just keep believing. We put ourselves out there. Let's keep believing. Everyone might think we're crazy, but we're going to believe. Another year passes by. And when that year passes by, at the end of that year, which is this past year in November, guess what? A group gave us $750,000, and another businessman gave us, in Alabama, gave us $650,000, so we bought the building, and now we're in the building, and it's filled up with men. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Yes. But we had to stand. We had to stand and believe. Cindy, where we live at today, our house, we didn't live there always. We lived up front and in a trailer up front. What would I do? People probably thought it was crazy. What would I do? So did I. <laughs> He'd take our company. He'd say, hey, I want you to come, come back here and see, see my house. And there was nothing there but trees. And he would literally give them a tour of this invisible house. Yeah, they'd come over to eat. And, <laughs> and, and they're thinking they're coming over to eat in a nice, you know, air-conditioned home. And I'd be like, come out, guys. I'm going to show you all my house. They're like, what? I said, my house. Come on. Well, you had to walk through cow pasture. So here they got their nice shoes on. And I'm like, stay on the cow uh, trail. And so <laughs> we'd walk all the way back, cross through the barbed wire. They'd, they'd be like, oh, my God, what is he thinking? And I would be like, no, don't, don't go through there. That's not the door. The door's over here. I said, this is the front porch. And I just did that. And I did that. And I did that. I would tell the kid, we go and camp out in our house. And so we'd put a tent out and the mosquitoes and everything and camp out in the house. But today, guess where we live? On that property right in that very place. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap of praise. You got to stand. You got to believe. Right now on Highway 42, we got this land. Guess what? I said, put a sign up. Put a sign up. Prairieville Campus. Church International, Prairieville Campus. Everybody's like, oh, where, where's it at? It's there. You don't see it? That's what you start telling people. Oh, it's there. You don't see it? We can go, we can go look at it. We need to start doing that. I knew, I, that's the Holy Ghost. I'm going to start bringing people to go show them the campus. That is there because one day it's going to be there. Can I get an amen? Because I believe in the power of God. Does anyone in here believe in the power of God? That if you don't give up on your miracle, your miracle will come to pass. Come on, somebody. Stand to your feet. Hebrews 11.6 And without faith Come on, read it with me. Ready? Well, that probably won't be cool because then I'm going to stop and mess y'all up. Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. For the one who comes to God must believe that He exists. Well, that's got to work and let's keep going. And that He proves to be one who rewards those who seek Him. Guys, that's the God we serve. But you've got to seek him. You've got to believe. You've got to know that he will reward you. And you've got to not give up on your miracle. Oh, come on. I said you've got to not give up on your miracle. In a moment, I'm going to open these altars for you to come down for the stirring and to petition God. But I've got to help you out. Let me get down here. There you go. Brian, you good? Life's good? All right. You need a miracle? Absolutely. Then you better be down here then, right? So a lot of people, when we talk about this, oh, man, yes, God promised this, or God's going to do this, and I want him to do this. But this is how we respond. We respond, we come down. If, if we come down, a lot of times we don't, which is a mistake. And we come down, and we just do this. 
And we want someone else to cry out for us. Instead of crying out for ourselves. I don't mind crying out for you, and I will. I cry out till I ain't got a voice anymore for you. And I'll believe God for you. But you can't, you, you, when you come down, you got to come down wanting to cry out to Him. You got to come down forgetting about your precious little dignity and abandon that so you can cry out to God and say, God, I need you to move for me, God. I need you to touch this, my God. I need you to heal me, my God. I need you to open that door, my God. I need you to get a hold of my kid, my God. Come on, someone. We got to pray and we got to believe. I need you to take this from me, God. I need the grace to stand because I can't do it. See, you got to come down here and you got to get real with God and you got to reach out to Him. You got to grab, you got to beat the altar, beat the altar, and ask God to move. Just like you believe in Him. Amen. He said, I see it in my heart. I'm healed. I want the elders, when we start praying, to get the all. And I want you, Pastor Joey, you get over here. We're going to pray for him. And we're going to believe God that God's going to touch him. Amen. But he's not just going to touch him. He's going to touch any of you that have a miracle that you believe in for. Something that you believe in for. Get down here at the altar right now if you're believing for it. But don't get down here being quiet. Get down here and begin to cry out to a mighty God. Come on, come down. Come on, come down. Come down. Come on, cry out. Cry out like you are desperate. Cry out like you are desperate. The heavens are roaring. The praise of your glory. Come on. you
some lingering that needs to take place. So I'm going to do something, guys. I'm going to dismiss everyone that needs to go. But I'm, we're going to continue on praying and believing and crying out right here at this altar. And so God bless you. Believe in your miracle. It's been a great day, man. So let's respect what God is doing right here in this place. Hey, thank you so much for watching. Please like this video. Comment if there's anything on your heart that you would like to share with the community. And be sure to subscribe and turn on your notifications so that you can be alerted every time we upload something new. You be blessed.